Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the entire audience who is today listening in in various remote locations. I hope everybody is safe and healthy in these challenging times. So today, welcome to another Kubernetes talk. I'll talk about D2IQ's version of Kubernetes called Convoy and the requirement of applications, or I would say stateful applications that would need persistent data store and how it actually can happen in reality where applications can provision storage on demand with zero storage touch. So as a end user or as a Kubernetes admin, you do not have to provision storage ahead of time for a lot of the stateful applications that you probably run in your business processes. And a lot of these things can be provisioned on demand. And we'll go through this different uh, slides in the rest of the presentation where I show you how storage can be provisioned on demand. And this has actually come up from a recent customer engagement that had that is in progress right now, where Convoy has been the choice of Kubernetes used in their environment on a storage platform, which is a completely flash-based uh, from pure storage. And we'll talk more about it as we start moving through this presentation. Now, there will be a lot of different stages of maturity of using containers and Kubernetes in this audience. Um, I just like to very briefly touch upon today's in modern world and modern applications, a lot of these uh, traditional applications or monolithic applications have been modularized and, and been designed to run in containers, either the ones that are transitioning from the monolithic to um, modern modular format or Newer and uh, new and uh, modern applications have been designed from ground up to run in a modular fashion as a microservice in containers. Now that could involve your development and testing environments, your web services, the entire pipeline that you're building, starting from your from your development cycle till the time you release the application to production. And there could be a lot of uh, multiple intermediary pipelines that could be traversing through the process. Like supposing if you have got your data, ton of data that has been ingested, where you're running analytics, which has been further fed into uh, some form of an AI ML pipeline, which does some kind of inference testing, modeling, uh, testing models, and eventually uh, deploying applications and releasing into production. So there could be multiple different pipelines that can actually run in parallel and in sync in various different stages and which would constitute to be a larger assembly line where the where could be designed for running various different business processes. And obviously enterprise applications are also starting to move into the containerized environment where it is much more easier to implement, design, and also manage. That's very important. So through this entire transitions that is happening from the traditional applications all over going to the modern modern nature, modern state, what happens to the data? What happens to the data that has been generated by these applications, by the end users who are using those applications? I would say when the concept of containers started years ago, most of these containers are stateless in nature. And maybe that was how it has been designed at the time where data was disposable. You just throw away the data once it is ephemeral in nature, and once you remove the container, the data is gone. But over the years, time and again, we've been proved that data is always valuable, translates into information, information translates into innovation, services, products that drive time to, uh, to drive the market um, and make sure that the product is more relevant and generates a kind of a, kind of a feedback loop back to the organization who actually generated the service or the product. So when we look into a lot of these changing dynamics, things are now changing and data is being generated in every stage. So containers who were more disposable in nature earlier are now starting to generate data and data needs to be available and rather reused and is very important 
that we keep the data for further analytics and further any, any kind of a machine learning purposes. Some some sort of intelligence has to be generated from that data that has been uh, that has been um, been part of this entire pipeline, and that is where the statefulness of the container comes into picture. And how do you make those applications running in these microservices systems as containers provision a data platform where they can store, manage, and protect the data throughout the entire data development pipeline? Now, we have been in this in this ecosystem of Kubernetes because Kubernetes has been has taken off immensely, and it has been an up, uh, upside. Um, it is, is, is been growing at a very fast rate right now. And there are different, apart from the open source communities, there are various just different distributions you're coming across. And there's some of them that you'd see in this, in this uh, slide. And D2IQ has come up with their a flavor of Kubernetes called Convoy, and that is what we are going to be focusing in this presentation moving forward. And having these multiple Kubernetes distribution customers always have a choice, but depending upon a business requirement, the choice can vary, like what exactly they would like to do with the convoy versus you know, Red Hat OpenShift. So those are the things which determined is, are being determined by the business parameters, the ecosystem that they live in, and the business utilization that they would like to have eventually. So let's, I'm going to spend a couple, couple of these slides to highlight the, the architecture of what convoy consists of. And if you look into Convoy, in the core, it has got all the components of Kubernetes. It has got a control plane, the database, the ETCD. Obviously, it is using container D. Um, and it has got Calico um, for the networking, which is a default setting. And then uses Ansible and Terraform for all the automation. Literally, Convoy has a, a, a directory of Ansible libraries which actually is responsible for setting up the entire environment and also the different add-ons, which Convoy calls as add-ons are various different applications like Prometheus and Grafana, USCI CD pipeline, a lot of these things. And we'll see that in a moment in, in a demo later in the presentation. But apart from that core, it has got various other different components that it connects to, like the policies that it provides, the service mesh, and the logging capability. And I was telling, mention, mentioning about the monitoring piece we're using Prometheus and a dashboard like Grafana. So a lot of these things also layer up on top of the core engine, which is responsible for various different cloud integration, whether you run your Kubernetes on-premise, on bare metal, or in the cloud. We have got multiple OS, or multiple OS support. So various different things have been, been part of this entire convoy ecosystem, which makes it much more robust to run your applications in, 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 in the Kubernetes cluster, either on-premise or in the cloud or in a hybrid mode. Now, if I were to look into the complete cloud native distribution, and if I were to categorize the various components that convoy has in its payload, starting from the infrastructure automation where it goes through a Terraform and Ansible as, as, as the infrastructure provisioning capability, it has got its uh, entire Ansible suite or set of Ansible playbooks, which goes and res is responsible for uh, implementing the entire Kubernetes setup. There are certain configuration files which you have to go through in the beginning. And once you do this configuration and have these files ready, then Convoy as an executable just goes and spins up the entire Kubernetes cluster seamlessly. Um, obviously, it takes help from all the Ansible playbooks that it has got internally built into it. Then, obviously, as I mentioned, it has got its all core components starting from the ETCD and container data that's the runtime. And then it has all the add ons. You don't probably have to run a Tiller account or create a Tiller account because Convoy itself is running Tiller internally. So, all you need to do is to have a Helm client and you can start connecting to the cluster right away. Like, for example, CSI, that's a big component because that's where we would be talking more on CSI, which stands for Container Storage Interface, which is a standard, which is uh, done by the Kubernetes community at the CNCF. 
where a lot of the storage vendors can actually use that CSI driver to connect to the backend platform um, for various different storage class. And we'll talk about that more in detail as we move forward. So Convoy supports CSI by default. It doesn't have any support for Flex drivers anymore. And I think Flex driver is, I don't think anybody is using it anymore. So how does pure storage use uh, this own CSI driver to connect with the Kubernetes cluster and provision storage on demand is going to be what, what we're going to talk about later in this presentation. Valero is another area where you'd be using some kind of an S3 backend. Either it's, it's currently just using MinIO, uh, where you're actually storing all your snapshots uh, in that location. Then obviously, your de de deploy, monitor, and logging involves Prometheus, Kibana, Grafana, all other applications, and they have got a whole suite of these add-ons available. And you can keep on adding the add-ons in their cluster.yaml file where you can specify the various different add-ons that you'll probably need to configure in an automated fashion so that you don't have to manually do this. Now, the question is, if I were to add a new add-on and the cluster is up and running, do I have to tear it down or bring the cluster down? No. You just go ahead and do a convoy up after adding all of these pieces together in the uh, cluster.yaml file and it's just going out, it'll go ahead and check what the status is of this entire cluster and just start to add on those components that have been newly added. And it is it's not going to interrupt any of your operations that's going on in an existing cluster at the time. So that's really neat. And this is very cleanly done. So now in this section of this presentation, I'll take you through the, uh, the process of, I would say the, uh, the narrative where why would a stateful application require uh, persistent storage? What is the need for it? And that is where there are some key requirements that, are, that, that has always come up in an environment where you have an outage when you are having a reboots or restarts that happens for an application. As I said, containers are always ephemeral in nature. And once you restart, all the data that is there is gone unless you want to store it somewhere. And that is not a default capability unless you have to have a, a Docker dash F or a dash V extension where you want to point to a particular location for the, that data to be residing. But if you don't have that, then it is all ephemeral, the data is lost. Then more and more applications when they start to run, mostly like databases and various different applications which are more of a, um, what do you mean, your sales model where it requires your keys, your passwords, your configuration, your confidential and configuration data it needs to be persistent because you would be reusing the data multiple times. Not only that, but also there is also other application generated or user generated data after a user or a group of users use a particular application which is running in containers, they need to, they, they generate data. And supposing if that data needs to be reused by the same users or a different team of users, we need to store the data. We need to manage the data. And that is where the persistent nature of data is very important. And secondly is the high availability and scalability. And that's the reason where, like for example, supposing if the application for, for whatever reason uh, goes offline, and if it is not an HA mode, then completely you have got an outage. So for an HA mode to actually work, like if a container points to a particular shared location in the data, then if one container goes down, you still have another container up and running because it is still pointing to a data set that is still in a shared mode and it can still provision or function normally in your business while you start to get the other container up and running. And having these capabilities inside a Kubernetes cluster because of the way Kubernetes actually manages your resources and spins up those containers, if one container goes down, it spins it up, but having a persistent storage underneath the cover helps to reuse the data when that container comes back online. So you don't lose that data that has been, uh, has been created or generated during the process when that application was running. So there were some, these are the one of the a few main data points as to why you need persistent storage. Now, having said that, what are the challenges? Yes, I need persistent storage. That means if I were to use a extended storage or, a, uh, or an external storage, do I have to mount each of the file system onto my controller nodes 
and then point my controllers or my containers to, to those mount points because that is where it, drags, it has to be stored persistently. But that is a that is a it's, it's a long process of doing it, and it is not it has to be manually done. It is not a process that you would really like to. Um, uh, I would say it's a process that you would like to automate in your environment, and that is where automating the provisioning of the storage is absolutely key because that gives you the ability to scale because you don't know how many persistent volumes an application would need. Now, if it is the if it's, if it's an off-the-shelf application, like for example, you are running a MySQL, or for example, you are running um, a Prometheus, so they also require some amount of persistent storage, and you probably would know how many data volumes they would probably need for a particular application, and you provision that ahead of time, and you run that application. Now, what happens during the process of creating multiple other applications or using Prometheus, you probably need some additional infrastructure or persistent volumes which you have to again manually create. So to eliminate the process and make it much more useful for Kubernetes to provision on demand, you need to have something running inside the Kubernetes cluster as a provisioner, which can provision data, uh, data platforms on demand. And it will be seamlessly for the admin who is managing the cluster and also the application and the users who are using it in that cluster. Let's take an example of, um, this is just an example of a four node cluster where you have see various different components. And you will see the CSI driver is running in all of these different nodes that are part of the Kubernetes cluster. Now these CSI driver talk to the storage vendor, which is the pure storage in this case. And pure storage has got two different products, which has got, which supports two different storage class. One is a block-based, another one is a file-based. Now, most of you must be aware of uh, the different modes that the Kubernetes, um, uh, Kubernetes provide for different applications. is read-write only, read-write many, and read-write X, right? So imagine you have got an application like your AIML, where you're running a lot of your machine language um, um, uh, applications where the data needs to be collaborated, needs to be shared. You're re reading and writing multiple times in the same location. So in that case, you need an infrastructure that can scale not only with the performance, but also with the capacity for different applications. And that provides resiliency. Now, if I choose to use a storage class called pure-file, that means I am now going to be mounting that particular PV, a persistent volume that you're creating on the persistent storage, which is a flash blade. In this case, Pure Storage has got two different um, products. The major products is flash array and a flash blade. A flash array is a block-based device, and a flash blade is got a file-based and supports S3 too. But today, we'll be only focusing on blocks and files as a storage class. So now, if your application says, OK, I would like to use storage class Pure file, that means it is going to create a particular PB on flash blade and do a mount of the CSI driver, which is running on all of these nodes, but they're responsible for mounting that particular PB onto the PVC that has, that has been created. So that gives an ability to have a seamless integration of a persistent storage uh, for the particular application where, where the data can be stored and that can be managed and that can be protected. So there is also a different manageability chain where you'll be having various different phases, how the data is actually moving in, um, in various different stages. Like you have got live data, you've got data at rest, you've got archiving your data, you could be protecting your data, you could be recovering your data from a failure. So there are various different stages of where the data can actually move through. And those are the things which the data platform can provide while it is still actively using in, or it's part of an active Kubernetes cluster. And this driver, which is called Pure Service Orchestrator, that's the driver or the CSI driver that is being provided by Pure Storage, runs as a first class citizen inside the Kubernetes cluster. So that's where you see the CSI drivers running on all of these nodes. And whenever there is a request coming in for a particular from a PV, to provision per, uh, persistent storage. Then it talks to the 
pure provisioner. And then pure provisioner says, well, you're asking for a storage class pure file with a two terabyte, two gig size of a volume or a file system size. I know where to go and get it. So I'm going to go and create that file system for you and then I can, you can start mounting it. And that is how it happens automatically under the covers. By the time you actually look for a persistent volume for an application, you have that already available. It's on demand and you have to have almost zero storage communication at the time. You don't even touch the storage. And that's the beauty that it becomes, it completely abstracts the storage capability through this driver, yet gives you the ability to carve out the size of the storage that you need and the ability to scale with as many number of containers you would like to run in your Kubernetes cluster. So the next two slides I'm going to talk about what exactly is a pure service orchestrator. That's what I was talking about. So as I said, pure service orchestrator runs in uh, inside the Kubernetes cluster, and I will show you in the demo later in this presentation how this has been running. And then you literally see this, um, and we, you know, we have got a GitHub location where you can download the pure service orchestrator. There is a values.yml file. It's a very minimum requirement you have in the values.yml file. All you need to provide is the information of the backend endpoint, which is a flash blade in this particular demo that I'll be showing. And then what it has is an IP address, an API token, and the data path IP. And after that, you are done. Then Convoy takes over. That means you're patching Convoy saying that, okay, pure file is going to my, be my default storage class. So any application that runs a request for a persistent storage, autom Convoy automatically chooses to go with storage class pure file and then provision that infrastructure piece of that volume and mounts it onto that particular PVC and the container for that application. Now, if you see this, this is the CSI plugin which sits right here, but what it is capable of doing is smart provisioning. As I said, it's all about smartness, about zero storage touch. It's literally seamless to the end user and it is done on demand. And elastic scaling, that's what I was talking about, about how you scale with the number of containers and number of particular persistent volumes that you have under the covers and transparent recovery. So if there is a failure, you can always recover from that absolutely fine, very quickly. And that's the reason why it gives you the ability to not go through the entire infrastructure play, but you get a platform like Kubernetes with the persistent storage underneath the covers, where the CSI driver with the, that ties to the storage layer, in this case, the pure storage flash blade, in the example that I'm going to be talking about, which gives, which gives you the complete ability for transparency um, of the recovery if there is any kind of a failure. And if you look at the particular um, list of products over here, we also have a cloud offering called Cloud Block Store. And that is where the PSO can run also in the cloud as well as on-premise. Now think about this. You have an application which runs on-prem today or you're developing an application on-prem today and you would like to release that application to crowd. You literally can do that because you are using the same set of APIs, the same service program, the PSO version will be actively uh, be useful over there. And you don't have any kind of a, a problem moving the application. And that's where the application portability comes in because you can literally spin it up in both the locations and still be able to um, run the same application because your data platform on premise and in the cloud is the same. Same set of APIs, PSO is the same, so you literally don't have any difference in when you're where you're running an application. But that gives you the continuity of where you want to run your application. And then is the automatic failure, automatic failover that you are having. I was giving you an example of an of a database. For example, you are running Postgres, and Postgres obviously doesn't have a resiliency if you are running it completely on block. If, if that particular container or node goes offline, uh, you don't have any way of failover. Now, what happens if you have multiple containers pointing to, a, say, a shared data set over NFS? Now, uh, there will be some kind of an overhead because of the NFS protocol, not all applications have been designed for NFS, but it still has the ability to provide you res res resiliency. If a node goes down, containers, obviously you can still have the containers move over to a different node and because you have got a common share on a shared infrastructure, you can still point to that data set and you still have your application running. 
So that gives you the ability to be more resilient as we start to move forward uh, in a bigger and bigger Kubernetes clusters and bigger environments. So having said that, what are the different applications you can probably run in this environment? As I said in the beginning, the objective is to make this a zero storage touch because of the rich API, uh, API offerings that we have, RESTful APIs, and with PSO's integration, which is natively running inside a Kubernetes cluster, you literally can provision any part of the storage through a container or even outside the container because we are also providing Ansible modules and playbooks, which you could be integrating that directly in your workflow, and you can provision that. And if you look into this diagram, the message that I would like to convey here is no matter what kind of an application you're running, you are providing one standard data management platform. You're eliminating the silos. It is easier to manage. It is, you're eliminating the server sprawl that you're creating by having so many different servers because you do not need the compute for, for that many. You're only adding more storage, but here, your compute and your storage are completely separate. You're disaggregating your compute and storage. You can scale with the number of nodes from a CPU perspective, and you can scale the size of your storage at the backend platform independently with how many cores that you have in your environment. So this disaggregation is the key effect that you normally see for any kind of workload. Now here, if you see here, your databases, which are latency sensitive, you could be running in a block environment, and you could be also having the modern application like the analytics, AIML, or even your CI CD process. They could be all using the same platform, and the data is going to be communicated back and forth. So you have a con continuity of data, as well as there is going to be a standard management suite where you can view all your data from one, one single pane of management. So let's go quickly to this demo, which I have here. So this is the Convoy environment that I have. And if I can quickly show you this cluster has got one master and four worker nodes, as you would see here. The version of Kubernetes that you're running and I'm running in this in this uh, setup is 1.16.4. And it's all CentOS Linux 7 that is running here. And if I look into the the storage classes I was talking about, and I'll quickly show you the um, the storage classes here. You see here, pure block and pure file. Now, pure file is the default setting here. Now, how did I do that? Now, before I get to show you how I did the pure file default. Let me show you the values.yml file, which actually is needed for this configuration, the CSI driver, and all of that information. So if I, if you see here in the values.yml file, all I need is this information for my backend storage, my management IP, my management IP, the API token, and the data path IP, that's all I need. And I can keep on adding as many number of item uh, endpoints that I would like. And this is where is one place that you're done. Once you are done, you just run this values.yml file to install our CSI driver. This is the one time, it's all taken care of. Now, how do I set my default YAML file? Now, yeah, in the default storage class, now, this is where you got to patch and this is a one-time thing, you patch it, and you're now your default setting is now your file. And that is where you are saying this, your file as default. So this is again a one-time change. So now, whatever applications you are going to run, depending upon um, the stateful or, or stateless applications that you're running, if I were to do a kubectl get pods, I have got supposing Nginx or MySQL running. Now let's see what PVCs I'm having. I've got a MySQL and then I've, there is a pure claim. So then I have got, what are the PVs that I've got? 
So each of these PVCs are now bound to a storage class pure file, which is, as I said, this is based on a file based as NFS, which is where our flash blade uh, product is used and is using the storage class pure file from our CSI driver. And all of these are bound. The status, if you see here, they're bound and the storage classes are all pure. Now let's get the uh, Convoy get ops. We got the password here. Launch username. So this is the, the convoy dashboard that you see here. And let's go to the Kubernetes dashboard first. So this is my overview with the pure CSI driver. I've got my storage classes listed here. Obviously, I'm looking at namespace default, as I was mentioning earlier. Convoy has got a different namespace called cube add-ons, and those add-ons will provide you the various different ports that it's running. I have actually gone ahead and uh, configured Prometheus and Grafana, and I'll show you very quickly how the persistent storage is actually running or sitting on flash blade on PO storage using the PSO CSI driver. And if you notice here, the Prometheus is, is running uh, all of the different parts over here and the persistent volumes, when I go here, you would see they're all bound to pure file and they are all like here it is elastic. I've got Prometheus, and then I've got um, the Valero, which has got Mini, Mini IO configured over here. So if I were to go back to the Convoy dashboard and go to supposing the Prometheus dashboard, and if I were to go and do my monitoring um, of my flash blade into Prometheus, that means I need some kind of an exporter to provide the data from my storage, uh, that is your storage flash blade, that, that uh, Prometheus can start to scrape. So I already have set that up. So I want to show you that flash blade is now sitting as a target over here in the Prometheus server that it has got to start to scrape. You see here, pure storage has been sitting as two different uh, labels here. And uh, if I were to go and spin up or start the Grafana dashboard, and I would like to go and use one of the dashboards, which I think is already so now if I were to go and monitor my storage here, the flash blade, you'd see various different metadata operations right here from the storage itself. So it is a client statistics that I'm capturing from flash blade. Now, all of these data that is being generated over here is sitting in flash blade directly. Now, let's look into this. Supposing I pick up uh, a PV that we listed over here. Uh, for example, I would like to do that for um, Prometheus. Now, let's look into this Prometheus PV that is being uh, added here, like, for example, PVC B3BAAEB7. Let's go and search that on the storage side to see where is it located. Now, if I go here, this is my storage platform, and you see right here. So this is sitting as a persistent storage and for Prometheus, and look at the data reduction I'm already getting 
from the data that I'm gathering. So the point that I'm trying to make here is it is just not only the data that is getting persistent over here uh, because you can reuse it whenever you want, but also the data compression capability at the array level is providing you a lot more a smaller data footprint so that you can have more data using less infrastructure. It's more for less, basically. So this is a huge advantage when you look into a lot of uh, uh, critical business applications where data footprint is a very critical thing, even though the data is extremely important. How do I actually con control the size of the data? And by compressing on the data in the array pl or the platform itself, is a huge, huge, huge advantage. And you never, or I didn't show, I didn't tell you any, anywhere in the demo that I created this manually. All of these has been done through the storage class in the pure service orchestrator that was running in, inside Kubernetes. And this is where it is tagging the K8S as a pre penning this and getting the entire PVC name to it, tagged to it. So you know exactly which volume ends up on the flash plate and where it's located. So that is a that is how it's actually going to be provisioning all of these volumes for any application that you're going to be running. So now to conclude this presentation, I'd like to sum up for any modern application, modern data experience, Convoy and PSO, whether you're running it on a flash array, which I didn't show that in the demo with the with the time limitation, where you can go through that on flash array as well as we saw the demo on flash blade. And we can do that on Cloud Block Store, which is where what I was mentioning about uh, the same platform that we are using on premise. We are also using it in the cloud and Amazon, S, uh, Amazon AWS right now. So, and we will be shortly be having CBS available in Azure too later this year. Now, what the main four points that I would like to highlight here towards the closing is infrastructure automation, which is on-demand provisioning. As you saw in the entire demo, I never chose to go and manually create a particular file system on my, <clears throat> on my persistent storage. All along, the CSI driver, the, uh, the PSO, was responsible to create the persistent storage and mount it to the particular container as on-demand. Then obviously, you can run multiple workloads on one data platform, that is the beauty of having a standard data platform so that you eliminate silos. You don't have to move data because data, it is after a certain point of time, has gravity. And moving data around is very challenging. The fact that you can disaggregate compute from storage, that is a key differentiator, first thing. And second thing, even in the storage, we have got compute. That means you are actually applying compute closer to data. That means you are not moving data around in order to do much more faster processing. The processing that is being done at the storage layer requires compute, and we already have compute available in, on the storage itself. And then the hybrid cloud, the work, uh, application portability, as I was mentioning, we have got the on-premise and, and the cloud presence in AWS with Cloud Block Store. The platform is going to be the same. The APIs are the same. The PSO can run on on-premise as well as on in the cloud. So literally, you can move your application either on-premise or in the cloud seamlessly without any challenges. And then if you were to do any kind of a performance or capacity scaling, we have a, a linear scalability with respect to performance as you start to scale your application load on the compute farm. So these are the huge, the four key uh, data points I like to emphasis on at this time with what, what, what a data platform should and could do today with Flash and Flash Pure, Pure Storage Flash Plate and Flash Array and Cloud Block Store. That's all I had for this presentation. Hope you liked uh, the information that I shared with you. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me Bikash RC sorry, Bikash at purestorage.com. It is B as in boy, I-K-A-S-H at purestorage.com. Thank you. Have a good day.